Good morning and welcome to Lee Park Church Online. Two weeks in a row, here we are because of inclement weather in our area. But we are able to come to you and worship with you, whether it's on Facebook or Lee Park Church Online or on YouTube now. We are thankful for that. As you can see, there's a lot going on at Lee Park Church. So I encourage you to become involved. Don't drift away if you're able to join us in live worship next week at Lee Park. But right now, we've got it coming to you. Great music, great message. Stick around. Lee Park on the way.
It's finished. It is done. Yeah, I heard you told death it was over. So in your name, I'll claim this fight is won. Hallelujah. Let's all worship together. It's been a great morning so far. We're glad that you are here. I'm glad to be back in church. I know you are.
Hello, Lee Park Online. We are so glad that you joined us today. Another week of icy and snowy weather. And so we're here we are online again. And we are thankful that you joined us today. We miss you. We miss you in here. I miss hearing you laugh. I miss enjoying you and your families and seeing you. And so we, you know that you are missed by your church, but we're so glad that you joined us online. I also want to thank you for the ways that you give. Thank you for texting to give, and thank you for giving online. You have been so faithful. We give the Lord all praise for that, but thank you for your faithfulness. Just a few announcements for you. I want to remind you that the Lee Park Youth Now Camp registration is open for the high schoolers. They'll be going to camp at Fort Caswell June 6th through the 8th, and the middle schoolers will be going to Ridgecrest up in the mountains, July 8th through 12th. That registration is open. You want to make sure that you save your kids' slot for that. We always have such a fun time at Camp Caswell and at Ridgecrest. And Jake Jake will be home this summer. I'm so excited for my boy to be able to come home and do that and go to those camps with them. And we're so thankful for all that Pastor Darren all the ways that he plans for our children and our youth. And so you want to make sure you sign up for that. Battle cry is coming. And, and we are thankful for it. We have a special guest, but we're so thankful for our Ground 40 family. And we are so looking forward to battle cry February 5th. I hope you'll mark that on your calendars and be a part of that. I know Wes is excited. He always brings excitement wherever he goes. And when he comes into these doors, we all get very excited about battle cry. So mark that on your calendars. Lee Park Prep Open House had to be canceled this past Friday. Friday. We have rescheduled it for January 27th, that Thursday at 6 p.m. here in the Worship Center. We'll give you a little tour. You'll get to know some of our kids. You'll see some of the testimonials of some of our students. If you have any interest in sending your kid to a Christian Christian environment all the way through, all of the teachers, every part of their curriculum, in middle school or high school, it is such a great school. As a parent, I can give great testimony for all that Lee Park has done in just our own personal our own personal family. We are very thankful for Lee Park Prep. So if you're interested in any way, please put that on your calendars, January 27th at 6 p.m. Well, you know that you are missed today. Your, your church family misses you. Let me pray for you now and your families, but thank you for watching online. Lord, I love you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this time together, together to gather in worship, whether at home or here in the, in the sanctuary. We give you all praise, Lord. You offer every opportunity. We have direct access to you, and we're more aware of that now, even now as we all watch online how faithful you are, and how much we desire to be amongst your people, serving and loving you and hearing the preach word. We pray now for the rest of the service that you would find us faithful, Lord, and please protect these families, keep them safe, those that are sick, Lord, that you would be so near, so close, Lord. We pray for all of them, Lord, that you bring great peace and great comfort that only comes from you. We love you, Jesus, for it's in your name we pray, amen.
Now, this series that we're in in Mark chapter 4 actually started back in Mark chapter 3 in verses 11 through 35, and it was about the mission. We have a mission. It is powered in Christ. It is powered in the Spirit. It is played out and powered in the church. That's sort of foundational to then everything else we were going to do in this series. And as we moved on to this sown in goodness, we moved in the parables that Christ shared. Now, what's a parable? Well, just to remind you, a parable is a short moral story with a symbolic meaning. A short moral story with a symbolic meaning. And we get another parable here today in chapter 4 on the issue of how. We've talked a lot about the power of Christ and the power in the church and what happens when seed is sown and how there should be growth. And now we move into the issue of how does this all happen? How is the mission played out? How is the message delivered? Christ gives good soil and that changes lives. How does the movement happen? That movement in Christianity, sharing the light of Christ. How does the standard of measure work? What are the expectations on us for our growth? And this week we see another part of the how of the mission, and that is the process of maturity. The process of maturity. And we see it in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 29. One more reminder, of course, that we are not having Dennis Swanberg. We did not have Dennis Swanberg Friday and, uh, or Saturday and Sunday. Not, we won't be here tonight. We're going to reset that at a time when COVID's not such an issue and weather's not such an issue. And the Dennis Swanberg people have been so easy to work with. I am thankful for that. So for the hundreds of you who've already got tickets and the more of you who were going to get tickets at the last minute, as Lee Park always does, don't worry, he will be back. We'll get that taken care of soon. All right, now let's go to Mark chapter 4, read verses 26 through 29. And if you'd like, where you are, you can stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And he was saying, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night, and he gets up day by day, and the seed sprouts and grows, how he himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Let's pray. God, thank you for this truth and our time together to look at and learn from your word. I pray that we would and keep our people safe, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. For those who are standing, please be seated. We've been noticing the forecast a lot lately, right? Last week it was the ice storm, this week the snowstorm, and it seems like we're paying a lot of attention to what is the forecast, five, six days out in advance sometimes. I can tell you this from experience, meteorologists don't love to give the extended forecast. They don't like to predict something so far out in advance because so many things can change as weather systems move across the country. They feel a lot more comfortable when it gets closer to the actual time. They feel a lot more comfortable about the forecast then. Well, there have been a lot of forecasts about what will happen to the church, what will happen to Christianity in this post-COVID world. I don't know that we're going to get to the post-COVID world anytime real soon, but at least now we can have a better idea of where we are in 2022 as we get now moving in a couple months in this new year. Tom Rayner released a list of things that churches should know. These are things that will be realities that the church will face in 2022. And there are nine of them. I want to go through them very quickly because this gives us an idea about what maybe the future will be like for Christianity and things we should be expecting. Here's the first. There's a lot of reason for hope. The idea that there's a lot of reason for hope is good news. The gospel still works. Christ still works. But we've also seen one in six churches return to their 2019 attendance. That's pretty good. And a majority of churches are not in financial trouble yet. So there is still reason for hope. The second thing that we can start to forecast about the church as we move into the new year is churches that grow more in evangelism and a priority in their ministry, they will grow more. These churches that grow will move evangelism to a priority position in ministry. This is something we've been seeing for the last few weeks here in the text, that need to share the gospel, get out and find a way to get involved and share the message because people will still be drawn, especially now, people will be drawn to a message of hope. Number three, denominational support will wane significantly. We're seeing this. Denominations are weaker. 
While local churches are doing okay financially, the denominations are not doing so well financially. So most denominations will struggle to help. They just don't have the money. And so churches will have to find ways, Tom Rainer says, to help one another. And of course, we've already got this process going, so we're excited about that. Number four, attitudes toward Christians and churches are not monolithic. Now, this isn't bad news either. There are people who are anti-Christian. That's right. But not everybody is anti-Christian. Just because they're not Christian doesn't mean they are anti-Christian. And one of the ways that we seem to be able to make inroads with people who are not Christian is by our involvement in the community, our willingness to get out into the community. And again, this is something Lee Park does well. And in Love Month, we'll be doing a lot of it. I'm looking forward to that. Number five, as we forecast into the future, part-time vocational ministry will become the norm. Rainer says more and more people are adding ministry to their lives. They're not leaving their jobs, they're staying in their jobs and then using what they can get from their jobs to then advance in more ministerial roles or more leadership roles in the church. This is a great benefit for the church and also a bit of a sign, I think, that there is kind of an awakening in God's people to do something and for that I am very thankful. Number six, horizontal growth will become a key strategy for growing churches. This goes back to the issue of denominations are not as able to help, and so what will happen to churches? Well, growing churches will help other churches. Healthy churches will help other churches. It's not just about growing your church big this way, but growing the church that way. Horizontal growth. And times will change, dates will change. You may have churches on different days of the week and different times, but you've gotta find all the different ways you can to grow the church outward and reach people that way. Number seven, they estimate as many as 15,000 churches will be confronted with the choice of closing or being adopted. Now, the only good thing about that is churches seem at least more willing and more receptive to being adopted or being replanted, and the church has got to help the church. Number eight, churches that resist change will decline more rapidly. That statement, we've never done it that way, will be the sentence of death for churches and at a more rapid pace than it used to be because technology has grown so much, the, the fight against the church has grown so much. If your church thinks it can just say, ah, well, it's just gonna, we're going to do it the way we've always done it, well, you're dead. You're probably already dead, and you're just kind of playing out the last sort of uh, death pangs that hit the church as it sort of gasps for life and life is not there. Number nine. More churches will struggle to find pastors. Fewer people want to be pastors. And churches are a little more selective in, and hesitant in how they pick their pastors. And pastors are more selective and hesitant as to whether or not they want to go to a church at all, even a specific church. So we've got fewer pastors and fewer pastors wanting to be pastors. Now you can see why there would be an anxiousness in the church. And here's my synopsis of what Rainer sees coming. The good news is the gospel still does work. Christ still does work. And people need the hope that comes in Christ. The bad news is Christians are still immature. And that immaturity in the Christian faith, that immaturity in the Christian church, means in many, time, many ways we are ill-equipped to give the country what it needs, to give our community what it needs, to give the world what it needs, which is a mature movement of God's people. All right, so now let's get back to the how. How can we get more mature? How do we even know what mature Christianity looks like? Well, in the text from the parable, we see this. The first thing is a maturing view of evangelism. Look with me in uh, Mark, verse four, or Mark chapter 4 there. In the first verse that we read, in verse 23, it's talking about the kingdom of God. What does it mean, the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God speaks to the rule of Christ in the heart of humanity. So when it's talking here about the kingdom of God, it means Christ's movement in the human heart to develop and grow and strengthen what will ultimately be the kingdom of God, the ruler of the kingdom of God in the heart of the people of God and them responding to it. Well, what does a maturing believer do? Well, we see there in verse 26. It was verse 25 talked about the kingdom of God. In verse 26, Christ ruling in the heart of believers, what does it do? It causes them to cast a seed on the soil. Now, we know from all the way back in the first part of chapter 4, verses 1 through 20, there are a lot of types of soil. 
There's bad soil, there's rocky soil, there is worldly soil, and then there is good soil. But this makes it clear, our job is not to judge the soil. Our job is to cast the seed. Christ does what He does when that seed make contact with the soil, and that hard heart will discard it, that worldly heart will avoid it, but that good soil will take it in. And again, our job isn't to make that judgment. Our job is to cast the seed. Look at verse 27. He goes to bed at night, he gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself doesn't know. It's not my job to know how God does what only God can do. It is my job to be faithful to sow the seed. It is my job to be faithful to scatter the seed all over on any soil, trusting that Christ will do what only He can do. Now, I don't know a lot about farming, so I can't use a farming illustration at all. I know a little bit more about what it's like to grow grass these days. Our fields out in the back are great fields, big fields. We can put soccer fields, softball field, baseball field, all that stuff's nice. But the grass isn't very good. It's not, I mean, the ground isn't very good to grow grass. So what we found out in this process is we can do everything right. We can, we can get uh, Carolina Green to come in. They're the best we can get. They're coming in to do their thing, and it's just hard to grow grass. You can do everything right, but the soil's just not great. So it's hard to grow grass on soil that's not great for grass. We've also got the best well digging company. The Loves folks came down, and they have done their thing to get us a well in the back to get water to the fields. It's not easy to get water. You can do everything right, but still it is hard to get water up, and then it's hard to get it to the soil that's not great to grow the grass that you want to grow. It's way easier in Christianity. I don't have to worry about the soil. I don't have to worry about the response of the person. While I want them to come to faith in Christ, I'm more concerned about being faithful to Christ. My job is to scatter the seed. The mature look is to be faithful enough to scatter the seed. The immature look is to judge the soil and put yourself in the position to judge rather than just being faithful enough to scatter the seed. Scattering the seed of the gospel is much less stressful. You can do it, you can go to bed, you can get up, and you don't know how Christ does what He does, but you've done your job. And He will get the glory for it, He will get the response for it, He will get the victory for it, and that's what we're supposed to allow to have happen, because that's the only way it really works. That's a mature view of evangelism. The next thing we see in the text is a maturing view of sanctification. Sanctification, by the way, is an overarching theme in this chapter. Really, a lot of the sermons could have been titled about sanctification. So what is sanctification? Sanctification, simply put, is this definition, the process of spiritual maturity. Now, there's, there's a lot involved in that. It would take a while to unpack, but this is the simple, clean definition of sanctification, the process of spiritual maturity. Verse 28 shows how that process plays out. A new believer grows into a mature believer. Look in verse 28. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. This process is ordered by, directed by, guided by, and led by the Lord. As the process plays out, there is first that blade. As suddenly what has sprouted from the seed in the good soil starts to show, and there it is. This early love for the Lord that you had when you first came to faith in Christ. This then developing love for the Word of God. This feeling that you had in you that you needed to gather together with other Christians and come together. This sort of, I have some growth in me. I'm starting to get it. I'm starting to love it. I'm starting to understand. The person now has the blinders taken off. God has given them the ability to see, and they see, and they start to enjoy what they're seeing. I have a blade. I'm getting it, and I'm loving it taking the shape of a Christian. Then as that develops, you see the head start to form in the way Christ lays it out. Very simple and still very easy to see and very good. People start to see that you're a real Christian. Once the plant starts to form, oh, I can tell what kind of plant that is. Once you start to form and grow in your sanctification process, people can say, oh yeah, that's a Christian. And that's the right kind of Christian. I, I know I'm growing up. I know I'm starting to be seen now. And then, of course, comes that maturing process as the plant now really forms. 
Everything is where it should be. Everything is developed where it should be. Now I am a grown up Christian. So you're, you're in different phases, different stages. Some of you have seen the blade, and that's exciting. Some of you are starting to form into the look of a Christian, that's exciting. And some of you are maturing as a Christian. Now, it doesn't necessarily tie itself to age. I know a little bit about age now. I turned 53 this week. I cannot believe I'm 53. It does not feel right to say 53. And so I'm older. I know, here's the thing. I'm older than most of the people watching this today. That seems so weird to me. And for those who are older than me, man, God bless you. That's got to be terrible to be older than me. But no, I'm, I'm sure, it's, I'm sure you're, you're doing just fine. You're watching, and I'm thankful for that. Spoke to a lady this week who turned 90 on the same day I turned 53, and she sounded great. So I guess there's hope for all of us old people. Anyway, as this plays itself out in this growing, this the fact that I'm 53 doesn't mean that I am some mature Christian. I'm a mature Christian because I've been a Christian for a good long time now, and there has been some growth. There was seeing the blade, then starting to form like a Christian, then being a mature in Christian, and even though I am a mature Christian, I'm still able to continue in this maturing process, and I like it. I want to grow more. I want to read more. I want to know more. God is good. God has been good. God has always been good. I find myself now in a more maturing state. I'm not asking him for things so much. I'm just thanking him for everything he's done. I'm not asking him to give me something or get something as much as I'm just saying thank you for what you have given me. Thank you for the life you've given me, the salvation you've given me, for the information you've given me, for the spiritual awakening you've given me. I am growing and I'm looking like the Christian I would want to look like and, and you're even giving me the opportunity, God, because of your grace, leaving me here longer. You're giving me the opportunity to day by day grow more and more in your image, and I can continue to grow and grow and grow and grow until you come get me. I am living now what the Bible says, the joy of my salvation. And if you have reached that level of maturity in your faith, you know what I'm talking about. There are all kinds of things to get upset about and get worked up about, but at the end of the day, I'm living in the joy of my salvation. I know where my hope comes from. I know where my help comes from. I know where my joy comes from. And he is with me every single morning. Now, as you're developing in that process, enjoy the process as God develops you in maturity. Here's a third thing. A maturing view of salvation. All right, verse 29 has some different interpretations. So let's look. Mark 4.29. When the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle. Because the harvest has come. Now, some see this very simply and, and maybe rightly as the return of Christ, gathering the harvest. For others, it is not just Christ coming to claim his people when the time is right, but developing Christians, producing more Christians. The harvest has come. It's ready now. It's time to go gather more Christians as more Christians are being made. It's not such an end times thing as a result of this developing salvation. That Now the harvest is full and it's ready for him to come with the sickle because the bride of Christ is growing and expanding. Now both are good points. And both point to a mature view of salvation, which is good. It's, it's, this is the process of Christianity. Whether it is that developing, harvest-ready field of Christians making Christians, or whether it is Christ coming now to actually take his people home, or, or us being a part of that process to develop more people to bring in to the storehouse, bring in to the fellowship. However you view this part, it's still a mature view of salvation. And let me show you how this process works. This is the gospel. This is salvation. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is a mature view of what we're all about. The gospel leads to salvation. The gospel leads to salvation. It's faithfulness and sharing that we talked about, and it's people responding as God gives them the ability to respond. It's, it's the growth developing in salvation. It's sanctification in developing spiritual maturity. You made the choice by faith. You came to Christ. He lined everything up, and you did good. You chose faith in Christ. And now he is 
growing you and developing you because of that salvation and developing a spiritual maturity. Then we see the gathering resulting from salvation. Now there's the desire to get together. We're adding Christians, and Christians want to gather together. As Christians gather together and grow from each other and learn from one another. So you've got the, the gospel, the growth, the gathering, and then lastly, the gain. The gain is the victory of salvation. More come to Christ, and Christ comes for his people. This is how Christianity is to play out. We by faith come to Christ. We by faith share Christ. We by faith see others come to faith in Christ. We then gather together in our, this salvation that we are experiencing. And as we live out this salvation, we are moving forward toward the gain of victory that we get in our salvation. As more come to Christ and Christ comes for his people. Now, we have to be careful. This doesn't become an extension of children's church. I love children's church. I love it. I, you, the, the, over there, we're going to make it better too. Children's church is great. We're going to make it better. We're already making changes in the ark. It's going to be better, way better. And we've got, if you're a kid, you go to children's church, you make a craft, you have some candy or some, uh, maybe not candy, some animal crackers, and you get a Bible story, and maybe you learn something about Jesus, and then you can t- tell your parents afterwards, learn something about Jesus. And it's very basic and very happy and very good, and it's that sort of that early part of information to develop people as Christians. Well, this is big church. And as much as kids' church is fun, this is not kids' church. There will not be animal crackers handed out. We're not going to make crafts on popsicle sticks. Uh, We're not going to try to color in the lines in our little kids' Bible. This is big church. And in big church, we've got to be careful that we're not giving you little church information, kids' church information. This needs to be adult church. Now, don't get me wrong, not boring, because I hate boring. Not boring, we don't want to be boring. We want to be great, we want to be excellent, but we want to mature you. We want to grow you. We want to gather with you, and we want to receive the gain that comes in that salvation. This is grown-up church for grown-ups, because Christ is growing us up. And wherever you are in that level of growth, I pray by God's grace and your faith that you've started the process and you're advancing in the process. And if you feel as if you're sort of stumped and stunted in that growth, I pray that God would convict you by the power of the Holy Spirit, you believer in Christ, that you would start to grow up and demand a maturing faith that has a maturing view of the faith and what our responsibility is in the faith as we live in the joy of our salvation. Are you a Christian? Have you by faith come to Christ? He's gracious enough to give you the opportunity. Maybe today he's been gracious enough to wake you up to your need for him. Well, now you're responsible. What will you do? Will you by faith come to Christ? I pray that you will. I hope that you will. There are people today that are on this online feed, and if you want to send them a message and get the information to them and make a connection with them, they can talk with you. They can start to have that conversation with you. If you want to send an email to the church and develop a relationship with a pastor, maybe you're ready to have a conversation about faith. Maybe, maybe you are a Christian. You're ready to grow up. Well, you can do the same things. You can connect with people online. You can connect with the church. We will find a way. We want to find a way to disciple you and grow you up, to send you out, to scatter the seed, to go get more, to gather them in and gain from the joy of our salvation. Wherever you are right now, if you are at home and you are finding yourself bound up in your house for another weekend, maybe this is a great chance for you to pull out your copy of God's Word or grab your phone and go to God's Word and learn more about the God that loves you and you're supposed to love. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for salvation offered in Christ. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. We pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good.